In war-torn Afghanistan, it's not the conflict or the Taliban that women fear most. It's their own families. A shocking majority of Afghan women are abused. They are beaten, raped, or even coerced into marriage by the people they love the most. But only a few dare to seek help. I'm Steve Chow. On this episode of 101 East, we meet the desperate women who are risking their lives to speak out against their abusers. It's a country that has been through 30 years of war. Millions of people in Afghanistan have been devastated by the conflict, particularly women. Under the Taliban, they were virtual prisoners, flogged or even executed if they dared to defy their laws. Much has improved since the fall of this brutal regime, but many still live in fear. A report by Global Rights estimates that around 90% of women here experience violence or are forced into marriage. Most suffer behind a veil of silence, never speaking about their torment. I've traveled to Afghanistan to meet a few women who have agreed to finally speak out about their abuse. We're on our way to a secret women's shelter here in Kabul, and we have to be very careful not to disclose its location or identify the women and the staff that are working in there. And that's because in the past, they have been given death threats by family members and conservative groups who think these safe houses are immoral. The shelter is protected by high walls, no men are allowed inside unless they're staff. Upstairs, I find 19-year-old Nehal trying to call her mother. But her mother is part of the problem. Nehal ran away from home after years of beatings by both her mother and older brother. Despite the abuse, Nehal is homesick. Her father died when she was a child and she has never lived without her mother. But by running away, she has brought shame onto her family and her older brother is furious. Nehal is not alone in her fear. The safe house is full of women who are terrified of their families. Many are hiding from husbands who have physically or sexually abused them. Others have fled their parents. A few are as young as 17, while some have children. All of them are here because they fear for their lives. The women here are cautious, but slowly over lunch, they open up. <laughs> 25-year-old Mariam ran away from her husband and in-laws three months ago. She says she never thought she would be nine months pregnant and living in a shelter. When I first saw my husband, I thought he was the right man for me. I wanted to be with him. 
Once we got married, I thought I'd have someone to share my pain and my secrets with. I'd have children and live a happy life. But less than a month after her wedding, Mariam's dreams began to unravel. Without warning, her husband started flying into fits of rage. During my last pregnancy, he lifted me up and threw me to the ground. I became very sick. All our cushions on the floor were wet with my blood. Over the years, she says there have been countless attacks. Her husband has been diagnosed with a mental illness. And during his most volatile episodes, he has threatened her with a loaded gun and a knife. Every time she tried to hide or flee, her in-laws would beat her. They would beat me with a belt. My husband would do it a lot. But my father-in-law and brother-in-law would beat me at night when I refused to sleep with my husband. I didn't go to him because he was threatening to kill me. I knew that if I slept in my in-law's room, I would survive. My in-laws wanted me to be with my husband so that he would not attack his father, mother or other people. If I wasn't there, he would beat my sister-in-law and other members of the family. Mariam is considered one of the lucky ones. She managed to find refuge in a shelter and for now at least, she's safe. But there are only 14 shelters in the country so millions of other women are forced to suffer on their own. But in March this year, a horrific attack on a woman in Kabul compelled many to break their silence and demand an end to violence against women. 27-year-old Farkunda, a religious studies student, was falsely accused of burning the Quran outside a mosque. Within minutes, an angry mob gathered. They beat and tortured her, eventually setting her body on fire. An investigation later proved that she had never burned the holy book. In the days that followed, thousands of people took to the streets, calling for greater protection for women. The attack on Farkunda at this very spot in downtown Kabul shocked the nation. How could a woman be so brutally murdered in the heart of the capital while people stood by and filmed it on their mobile phones? To many, it confirmed what they had suspected all along, that Afghanistan is one of the deadliest places in the world to be born a woman. Dr. Seema Samar, a well-known human rights advocate, says that after decades of war, violence has become routine here and women are the most vulnerable. The people's moral sensitivity is low, that everybody is running to hit her rather than protecting her. This was not the case before the war in this country. Unless we uh, really abolish violence against women, I don't think we will have a society free of violence. Because I think it, it is a vicious, vicious circle, it's going on. Back at the shelter, it is this cycle of violence that Mariam is trying to break by starting a new life. But she has a one-year-old son who still lives with her husband and she desperately wants him back. Today, she's meeting with a lawyer to discuss her options. شما واقعا این خواهان طلاق خود هم هستند در صورتی که شما یک اولاد هم دارید یک اولاد یک طفل هم دارید و یک طفل دیگه هم فعلا در بعد میتونه است ببین خیلی مشکل است یک مادر در این حالت یک زندگی خراب و هم بخواد باز طلاق بگیرد باز تایی که در کجا باشه این مسئله اولادهاش چی میشه The lawyer is trying to convince Mariam to return to her husband with no income he says a court is unlikely to grant her custody of her son. As خواهر از شوهرت مثلا تعهد بگیریم ضمانت بگیریم که دیگه تو را لد کوب نکنه از خوشی نه دمرایت کار نگیره و برای زندگی خوب و درست برای تهیه بکنه 
این یک گزینه دیگه است کی جان زرغونه جان حالا اگر خانواده شاورت خانه دوا شاورت دم خوشویت خسارت اینا تعهد به زمانت به که من برشم چوب می تو من زندگی خوب جور می کنم و اصلا در زندگی شان مداخله نمی کنم مازشت تعهد بگیرم زمانت بگیرم میری باز امرایشان یا جای زندگی میکنی یا نه یا اطمینان نداری سر جان باشه هیچ میدان ندارم به خاطر که زیتا سری برای میتونه ندارم به خاطر که زیتا خوشون تا طرف برای میشه سرم تا که دست به کشتن میزن بسیار عصبانی میشن وقت که مریم فیلز شی هاز تو چوز بتوین هر لایف اند هر سنز اگر یک جو باشم که چون خود میتون ایف آی گو بک تو مای هزبن ات لیست آی کن گیو مای سن ا گود لایف ایف ہی از ٹیکن اوے فرام می and I live separately. I can't do anything for him. I miss my son a lot. He would still be with me if I had a place to live. Meanwhile, Mehal is still trying to convince her mother to let her come home. But her family is certain that she has run away with a boyfriend. But suddenly, the phone is disconnected. It has been almost a year since Nehal left home, and she's running out of options. She has no other family to turn to, and she can barely read and write, let alone find a job. What she thought was her path to freedom now feels like a prison. We're not very happy here. We're locked up. We can't go anywhere. I was planning to go back home, but my mother wasn't happy about this because of my brother. She said he would either kill me or kill himself because I took away his dignity. I'm alone. Where am I supposed to go? There is no one with me. Where should I stay? How long should I stay here? One year? I can't stay here forever. Nehal says she tries not to think about the future. Instead, she sews curtains to earn some money. She says she still loves her mother, but she hasn't forgiven her. I was doing all the housework by myself. When my mother would come home from work, even if there was one glass out of place, she would get angry. She was just looking for excuses to hit me. My mother would kick me and beat me with a stick. Sometimes she would grab me by the hair and throw me against the wall. The abuse became too much for Nehal, and she wanted to kill herself. I would cut myself with a knife. Once I took a gun to shoot myself, but my sister stopped me. I swallowed small stones and I would bang my head against the wall. I still get headaches because of that. I thought to myself, it's better to die once than to be beaten every day. Nehal could never bring herself to commit suicide, but many others do. Rights advocates believe that Afghanistan is one of the few countries in the world where female suicide rates 
far outnumber the males. At Kabul's Istiklal Hospital, the staff in the Burns Ward often see the horrific consequences of failed suicide. While these patients were injured in accidents, they also treat women who have deliberately set themselves alight. This specialized burns unit has treated hundreds of self-emulation cases over the years. The patients and their families often say that it was an accident, but the staff here tell us that they know better. Suicide is a crime in Afghanistan, and it also brings shame to the families of victims. That is why many here try to hide it. But nurse Mathia Ahmad says she has learned to see past the lies. She says if a patient has more than 50% burns to her body, the chances are she attempted suicide. We know if the patients pour the oil from the head to the toes and they smile. Uh, they smell of oil. Oil and then we decided that maybe the patient is self-emulation. The injuries are often severe. Madia admits that sometimes all they can do is reduce the pain. It's so difficult uh, for treatment of more than 50 percentage of birth. It's difficult. And what is the survival rate? Do they have a good chance of survival? No. Most of them are died. Back at the shelter, staff say they do what they can to save lives. They teach women about their legal rights so they can protect themselves. It's simple advice, but it often comes as a revelation to women here. Most are unaware of the laws that help protect them. But today, these laws and the shelters are under threat from powerful people who want to abolish them. These so-called safe houses are very bad. They protect people who are doing wrong things and give them immunity. They open the gates to social problems like AIDS. Nazir Ahmed Hanafi is a popular member of Afghanistan's parliament. He and other lawmakers are fighting laws that protect women against violence. He also believes that shelters were introduced by foreign groups to undermine Afghan values. These foreigners want to impose their Western ideas onto us before they even think about whether it is beneficial. They have destroyed their own society. They live isolated lives like animals and they have no family support system. Hanafi is vehemently opposed to domestic violence laws because he says they can be misused. A woman can claim that her husband beat her, and even if she doesn't have any marks, the court can sentence him to three months in jail. This is wrong. A man spends more than $6,000 to get married but then he ends up paying more in the court case, and all this over a mere allegation. It is in the Quran that everybody is born with dignity, with equal dignity. Then who you are that you are making yourself superior than I do. Nowhere in Quran it said that they are lower than, than the men. It's a lack of human security. Dr. Seema Sama says firebrands like Hanafi are common in parliament. People like him. They believe that they, are, they have the superiority of being men and having a long beard. They are not there to think that every human being are equal. But I think if, if women are, are united, if women are really committed to, to make an environment, again, those kind of men are minority. It's a message echoed by the country's first lady, Rula Ghani, 
named by Time magazine this year as one of the most influential people in the world. Ghani has created waves by being the most publicly visible wife of an Afghan leader in almost a century. Born in Lebanon, she says Afghanistan was much more liberal when she first lived here in the 1970s. When I first came, uh, women had their space in society. Uh, they were respected within the family. They were respected if ever they took up jobs outside the family. Uh, they were respected in public spaces. It was really very, uh, a very civil society. And um, somehow I hope that it will come back to it. But this change, she says, can only come from women. There is a saying that says, uh, this is your world, shape it, otherwise someone else will. I feel that uh, uh, people think that they can come and do it from top, that say, okay, we're going to grant you rights. Rights are not granted. Rights has, have to be earned, they have to be, uh, they have to be taken. At a local hospital, Mariam is getting a glimpse of her baby. It's a girl. She's due to give birth very soon, and she is determined to give her daughter a good life. I feel calm and happy because my baby's fine. I'll be able to hold her soon. Mariam has decided to return to her husband. With two children to support, she doesn't have much choice. I'll go back to my husband if he finds us a separate house for us. If I go back to my in-laws, I'll face even more violence because they think that I've brought shame onto them by staying in a shelter. A few days later, I meet Mariam's husband. I want to hear his side of the story, and after much negotiation, he has finally agreed. To protect Mariam, we won't reveal his identity. He admits that he beat his wife, but he says it was never serious. My wife is so stubborn. She was always arguing with my father, my mother and sisters. So one day I hit her. Before that, no one even told her to do anything. There was no problem. Everyone had their own place in the family. It was just her behavior. There was no other problem. Only God knows how I felt seeing how she treated my family. I also felt sad after I hit her. I was so fed up, and that's why I did it. She wanted me to rent a separate house for her. I was willing to do that, but she shouldn't have run away. Mariam's husband says he wants his wife to come home, but he's suspicious of the shelter. How can I know what's happening inside this shelter? I've lived all over Kabul. I know every place, but God only knows what's happening inside these shelters. Nehal is only too familiar with this kind of suspicion. She has given up on returning home, but she has nowhere else to go. I don't miss them anymore. I used to. I would cry and feel so depressed. But when my mother told me not to come back, I just took her out of my heart, and my heart is now black. I feel like I have no one, no mother, no sister, no brother. Here they think if a woman is free, she's doing something wrong. They will attack her. In Afghanistan, they don't let women live their life the way they want. For now, Nehal's life is in limbo. She says she wants to leave Afghanistan and start again. She dreams of being free and of living without fear. Most of all, she dreams of having a family that will love and protect her.